The UK economy is broken. Since 2009, economic growth has stalled, debt has risen, and public service is damaged. Living standards have stagnated and are forecast to get even worse. But what can we do to change this long, slow decline? The UK definitely has a housing crisis. House prices are eight times income and rents have increased faster than inflation. The result is that the share of income spent on housing has increased. This has both increased inequality, but also reduced disposable income, leading to less spending elsewhere in the economy. The UK is simply not building enough houses. In a recent report, the Competition Commission noted that private house builders prefer to restrict supply to keep up prices. There are over one million plots with planning permission, but building hasn't started. Empty land could be taxed to prevent investors seeking profit without building. But the government should also be more willing to actually build and meet its own housing targets. In the post-war period, government policy helped build up to 400,000 new homes a year. Now, in March 2020, the budget allocated a mere £9.4 billion over five years for affordable housing, less than £2 billion a year. And this pales into comparison with a recent uh, £10 billion worth of national insurance tax cuts. Now, how to pay for much greater spending on building housing? Well, the truth is that house building in the UK is quite profitable. Building affordable housing would help to reduce the 25 billion housing benefit bill. Building houses for market rent will help fund future building and give significant economic benefits of a lower rent and greater geographical mobility. Borrowing to build more houses is not maxing out the nation's credit card. It's more of a profitable investment for the future. Now, higher education is one area where the UK is actually internationally competitive. Foreign students bring in around £40 billion a year to the UK economy. And we have to accept where our economic advantages lie. The UK is just not going to become the world's leading manufacturer of solar panels. So rather than cut foreign student numbers in order to meet immigration targets, the government should build high-density student accommodation in university towns. They could even build a new university in struggling towns like, say, Sunderland. New housing doesn't have to be built on sprawling greenbelt land like many of the current developments. We can try to build more apartment-style high-density build-up higher. And we do need foreign students, but we do need to build more housing to accommodate them. Now, regional inequality is rightly diagnosed as a massive problem in the UK. But how to change this? Firstly, local councils need more funding. Levelling up is not about just good intentions. You need the funding to back it up. Now, council tax is currently very regressive, based on outdated values. The Economist recently noted that the council tax on Buckingham Palace worth a billion pounds is £1,828, less than the council tax on a three-bedroom property in Blackpool, one of the most deprived areas in the UK. So council tax is highly regressive, with the rich paying a much smaller share of their income and wealth. A move to a simple property tax of 0.4% of the value of your home would enable councils to raise more money and invest where it is needed. The IFS have estimated that 70% of households in England would pay less tax. Now, some in the South and the richest 10% would pay more, but we do have quite high wealth inequality, and this would be a start to improving equality in society. Now, also very important, levelling up shouldn't come just from Westminster, but be guided by local mayors, local councils, local people. Central governments tend to have grandiose schemes like a super-fast national railway. The tragedy is that the North would have gained greater economic benefits from smaller scale regional tram and bus networks, which help people get from the suburbs and small towns to the big regional cities. What is really needed is not white elephants like HS2, but a large number of small incremental improvements across the country. For example, take Manchester's uh, successful decision to take buses back into public control and its expansion of its tram network. This doesn't just benefit Manchester, but surrounding towns like Bury and Rochdale. UK public sector investment has fallen in recent decades, 
and is forecast to keep falling. But the UK has a creaking electric grid, transport bottlenecks and a growing backlog of healthcare investment. There is a need to invest in renewable energy, battery storage and energy infrastructure. It's not just about building new houses, you have to have an electric network ready to connect. And if the UK does expand building renewable energy such as offshore wind farms, it's right that the government own at least part of it. In the past, the UK has been too willing to squander its own wealth by privatising the most profitable energy generation rather than investing in a sovereign wealth fund like, say, Norway. And it's not just about spending more money. Increasing investment in the right areas has the capacity to help improve public sector productivity, which is currently very low. One problem for the NHS is that it has a simple lack of beds. England has one of the lowest rates of beds in the OECD which means that staff juggle patients and waste time looking for vacancies. Actually building new hospitals and investment in new technology and diagnostic equipment can start to help increase productivity. So that has to be part of the story as well as spending more money. One of the easiest ways to improve the UK's economic prospects would be to rejoin the single market and customs union. Exports to Europe have stagnated since 2016 as firms have seen an increase in bureaucracy costs and custom barriers. At close to 45% of our total trade, the EU is still our most important trading partner. Rejoining the single market would provide a fillip to business investment and small and medium-sized firms would benefit from lower custom costs. Now, if people worry about the issue of migration from Eastern Europe, it's worth bearing in mind that wage differentials have dramatically narrowed since the early 2000s. At the current trend rate of growth, Poland could overtake UK wages by 2035. So it may be the single market enabling people to go and work abroad rather than the other way around. The UK has seen a rise in economic inactivity, especially older people leaving the workforce. And this is a loss of productivity and potential economic growth. Changing the tax structure and increasing incentives can also reduce inequality at the same time. The UK needs to be willing to tax wealth more and use that to continue to cut national insurance contributions. Only 4% of the current population pay inheritance tax. This should be increased and extended. Now, if someone in their late 50s uh, inherited a lot of money, they would be tempted to take early retirement. I definitely would. Now, this policy of increasing inheritance tax would mean that I would likely pay a lot more tax in the next two decades. But I think overall, it would be good for the economy, reduce wealth disparities. Now, currently, the tax structure means that there's crazy incentives. Some families with three children face up to an 83% marginal tax rate. Lower national insurance would help improve this. The government also needs to find a way to tax uh, big monopolistic tech giants, which have very high revenue, but hide their profits in offshore regions. And with the growth of artificial intelligence, this will become increasingly more important and I haven't got time to go into now, but maybe a universal basic income could be a way to deal with this growth of monopoly tech power. The UK needs to become better at building things. Planning reforms are currently too expensive and prone to delays. Why is it three times more expensive to build a subway in the UK than France or Spain? Spain insists on standardised, uniform building systems, streamlined planning regulations, and making use of past projects that worked. HS2 was hobbled by expensive planning regulations, political meddling and over-engineering. The planning process for a new tunnel in Kent has already cost £300 million before work has even started. That is more money than the entire cost of building the world's longest road tunnel in Norway, hardly the cheapest place to build things. Planning reform would also make it easier to build those high-density housing where the demand is greatest. In the US, the Inflation Reduction Act offered generous subsidies to firms who build batteries and EV technology. It's seen a surge in private sector manufacturing investment and has increased take-up of a new generation of technology. The US policy has been very successful in stimulating private investment, economic growth, and technological development. The UK is currently lagging behind in its switch to electric and needs a lot of investment in EV points. The US experience also shows that a modern economy is not doomed to stagnation 
and it's important to not become overly pessimistic. If the US can grow, why can't the UK? Now, the US paid for all of this by borrowing, and US debt deficit has definitely increased. I would prefer to pay at least part of it through higher carbon taxes. I would reverse the decade-long decline in petrol tax and start to encourage electronic road pricing for the days when um, petrol cars are no longer in use. If we're not willing to have some taxes on cars, it will lead to greater congestion, which is an economic cost, and declining public finances. The government's recent uh, tax cuts were funded either through higher borrowing or lower spending in the future. It is like the trust tax cuts, but on a smaller scale. However, in the current climate, unfunded tax cuts are a false economy. We pay lower tax, but the result will be longer waiting lists in health, justice and local councils facing bankruptcy. And it's also going to in, in, almost certainly mean higher taxes in the future, because we can't keep cutting taxes by borrowing. Now, the UK, in a way, is trying to have European-style welfare system with American-style taxes. But with the UK's economic growth, this is not sustainable. This is not the time for unfunded tax cuts. If a policy, if we want to promote tax cuts, we need to be more honest about the trade-offs involved in terms of opportunity cost of lower public services. The next policy will be to place greater weighting on vocational skills. In the UK, the share of people who don't take a degree but stay in training after 16 is only around 32%, less than the OECD average. A lack of vocational skills and medical doctors and nurses has led to a shortage of workers, pushing up wage costs and harming productivity. Now, I've tried to avoid vague policies like improving a nation's health, but I'm mentioning it here because it currently is a huge barrier to economic growth and quality of life. Now, of course, there's no magic bullet. There's a limit to what the government can do. But I wouldn't shy away from putting taxes on healthy food, subsidising healthy food and active travel, and encouraging investment in treating long COVID and similar diseases which are really causing a lot of the uh, decline in participation rates amongst older people. Now, overall, a lot of these policies do involve the government, but it is important to bear in mind that a lot of economic growth will need to come from a private sector. What a government can really do is to create a feel-good factor by avoiding unnecessary damage, investing where it is needed, and creating stability for firms to invest. Frequent new turns on tax and trade policies are very destabilising. Firms like to plan ahead, and we need to avoid this temptation to every six months introduce some massive new tax changes. A government's job is to avoid uncertainty, frequent radical changes of direction. At the same time, bold, decisive action uh, is definitely desirable. The government has a target of 300,000 homes, which is really quite modest. They should be determined to really meet a target and end the years of failing to meet their own targets. Although a divisive figure, Margaret Thatcher had a vision for the economy and was not distracted by short-term politics. A new government could try to emulate at least some of her conviction, if not necessarily her policies. This video looks at the contribution of Margaret Thatcher to the UK economy and how their legacy still uh, reverberates today.